Uh, hello, everybody. James here. Story time with Dutch Man Tell. And Dutch, you didn't even compliment me on the camera. I got a new camera just for you. Sorry, this is for nobody else. Look, I've, I've really? got, yeah, I've got the same camera that I use down here, broadcast camera, just for you now, so you can see me in. Um, uh, wow. I don't know, probably the exact same quality when it goes through Zoom. Wow, well, but damn, I didn't notice that. Oh, there you go. That so, was that was six hundred dollars well spent. Is that what it is, really? Oh, the camera's more than that, but then you have to have like these special wires that um, bump it up about another two hundred. So that's like nearly a thousand dollars worth of camera just for you to not notice the difference. Well, I didn't notice the difference. There you go. Money well spent. There we go. But at least I can write off against my tax. How's the mustache doing today? Oh, you said symmetrical. That's what we're That's we so for. symmetrical. It's not nothing so symmetrical today. But anyway, we'll, we'll go with that anyway. The thing so, is, it, it changes throughout the podcast anyway, so it might just flourish, you know, like at half time or something. Yeah, okay. We'll okay. Do, oh, oh, yeah, we have, to do, we have to do plugs, don't we? Okay, Dutch Mantel has two books the world according to dutch and tales from a dirt road if you want them unsigned you can go to amazon if you want them signed like so oh, many things i didn't put them here today because uh, i'm in hang on i'm in i'm in the process of changing things ah, around too Ah, look at this hey whoa dirty dutch man tell two books there if you want them unsigned go to amazon if you want them signed you go to dirty dutch man tell with two l's at gmail.com dutch also has diplomas for sale he also has are we doing trading cards yet or is that just a well we're not doing trading cards, but since we're talking about it, I want to show you. Have I showed you this before? I think I have. A figure or something else. But it's uh, this card is right here. Let me see it. Oh, the it? original trading card. The original, yes. Oh, I think it's right here. Oh, that's it. This one right there. And you see that? And mm -hmm. signed also. They only made 2,000 of these in probably the early 80s. You know what's this card? Well, I, mm. I hate to say what it's worth. It's only worth what you can get somebody to give you for. That's the worth of it. But I've seen it advertised for $750. And this is the last card that I have. Now, I used to have, if I'd have known this years ago, you know, I'd have been, I'd have been a, uh, I, I would have fell under the collector mode, but I'm not a collector. Mm -hmm. And I have thrown this around in my head back and forth. Should I let this go to a collector who, who knows what to do with it? But it is up for, I have decided for a high enough price. I will let this go. It's already signed. So what do you think it's worth? Well, I think for a signed one, I don't know, we could be getting to three or four hundred dollars. I mean, as you say, it's only what someone's willing to pay. Yes. It? So uh, who took that photo of you specifically? I did. You took that photo of you? No, all these pictures and photos are stolen by Norman something, Keish or something that's and he, but he didn't just do it to me. He did it to everybody. And he put on sale. And this is before wrestlers really understood their worth to fans. Uh, it wasn't lost on him, nor was it lost on the promotion because they, they would sell the hell out of this. And, but well, there you go. that's the only way, that's the only way a lot of people, uh, wrestlers could work in Tennessee. Because they got their they got their full run on their on what, what we call gimmicks, they got their full run on it. So if you get kind of some of them would have even worked there for nothing just to sell their gimmicks. Some of them did practically. Stop that! I can't believe you're talking about Nick Goulas. <laughs> and when Jerry Jerry took over, it, it, it was better, a, a lot better, but. Uh, Let's say, take the fabs. I've talked to the fabs before. And when I said something about them, they heard about it. Oh, they got all upset, I guess. But the question was, you know, when they took Steve Kern, who was just a wrestler, great, his, his wrestling didn't suffer uh, when they made him, a, made him a fab and teamed him with Stan Lane. But they went from third match on the card and just being on the card and just being a, just a wrestler 
to being something special. When they made them the fabs, they, they did all these uh, videos on them and say a house that was doing, say it was a $1,500 arena, a 1500 seat arena. It might be doing say in the 400 range, 500. But when the fabs, the first time they were there, they sold it out. No angle, no nothing. You just got to see them. And of course they were dressed up and, uh, they, they took that, uh, sharp dress man by ZZ top and they dressed up and that kind of became their, you know, their entrance song. So they were hot, really, really hot. But anyway, well, well uh, do you know what, because they, you mentioned the fabs, they, uh, how much do you think they made a gimmick table at, uh, the mid South Coliseum of a Monday? A piece? Yeah, well, collectively, it's, I mean, it's collective probably, tag team. Probably a thousand dollars. So a thousand dollars on a Monday just in photos and that's it. Yeah. What else no, would, they, would they sell? I think else? they made that individually. Oh. I think that was a thousand dollars after they had split. That meant there would be, and this was by when they used to have what they call the four by six photos eight that you could ten. have done. When oh, they weren't eight by tens, but three by five. Let's say that. Okay. They were selling it years ago for a dollar. I said, guys, I'm a little me. I'm saying, I think we could get two. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. We, we'll never get two. We, well, I said, well, try it. And they put it out there for $2. Guess what? They still sold. So now, all of a sudden, the wrestlers have just doubled their payday on Monday night and the fans didn't really notice it that much or they wouldn't have bought it. But yeah, the fans, they made more off what we call the gimmick table than they made actually wrestling. So. Did they, cause I know like in Smokey and stuff, you would man your own gimmick table, but in Memphis in the heyday, would all the wrestlers man the gimmick tables at, the, uh, at that time as well? Well, we did sometimes. I mean, you could go out there and because uh, Miss Jarrett, who was Jared Jarrett's mother, she would say, hey, can you come out tonight and just and sign some of your pictures? And she was saying it very nicely. She wasn't ordering you out there because – she was getting about 25% of it herself just to man the table, which was fine, really. But a lot of places would just sell you a picture and not even tell you. I think uh, in the Jim Crockett era, I asked Rock and Roll one time when they got hot, you know, and when they were doing that sellout business, how much did you make off gimmicks? And they looked at me like, shut the hell up. Don't even remind us of it. <laughs> because they was making nowhere close to what they should have been making. I mean, they were hot. You know, if people can, let's say you're a, 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 a big star and you would go out there and your pictures would be on the table. And if the fans could come up and buy a picture and get you to sign it, right in front of them, that was a big deal. Because now, not only would they they get the picture, they would get to talk to you for 30 seconds, not long, because they had a big, long line behind them. And people say, hurry up, let's go, let's go. But that that was the main selling point, is that they get a few seconds with you. And it was, bands loved that. And the wrestlers loved it too, because they were making money. And they could scout and, some of the women as well. Stop it, James. The wrestlers weren't like that, and you know that. Stop it. <laughs> uh, yeah, what they what was, seat uh, are you sitting in tonight, my dear? What seat am I sitting in? No, not you. I'm, I'm, I'm role-playing a fabulous one saying, you know, oh, so what are you in, like, 4F tonight? All oh, right, okay. Keep an eye out for you and, you know. Stop it. Stop it. But anyway, it was uh, the gimmick business was never lost on the promotions. They knew it was there. But when the wrestlers finally found out that it was there, now, 
let's talk WWE just for a minute. Hey, just remember, we're going down the road. We're in the car. We're talking. The WWF were some of the biggest thieves in the world. You know, you get your royalty check. Now, I didn't expect my stuff to sell because I was like middle of the card and I was like a heel and I was like a manager. So you wouldn't expect that stuff to sell. But I've talked to some of the other guys and they says, brother, they would get like a percentage of, like it was less than 10% they would get. And then they would give them the old song and dance. Well, we got to have them produced and we got to pay for that. And we got to ship them and then we got to put them out there and we got to do all this. Well, hey, that's part of selling something. You got to make it available. Yeah, we got all that. And some guys were making like, I, I, I'll go I'll go back a little further. A guy wrote a book. I can't remember the guy. Oh, I know, I know who it is. We've talked about this. It's William Regal, isn't it? Yes, it is Regal. Yeah. And I says, and I'm thinking, and they sold the book for like $20, $25. I said, well, those royalties have to be have to be pretty good. He went, please. He said, mate, <laughs> with that proper British accent, he said, mate. <clears throat> and what he was saying was, no, it's nowhere like you would imagine. I says, what do you mean? And I said, what did you get per book? And you know what? He, I, and I've said this before, if anybody paid attention, which they probably don't. He said he made like a dollar and a quarter, a dollar and a half a book. I said, that was your royalty? He said, yep, that was it. Because now with Amazon, which is what I deal with for, for my books, <clears throat> you can you can set your own price. I mean, they have a price there. But... I mean, if if you're going to sit at a table and people want to buy your book and you're going to sign it and you're going to customize it to Bill or whatever, and then he can he can he has that for a lifetime and he gets the book. Yeah, it, it's worth a few bucks because he he's got something that you know is becomes a a keepsake of his wrestling days and who his favorites were and you know he can he can show that to people. And it's not in, in my books. I'm 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 gonna say this, folks. It's a good read. It really is. Mm. But but and you have never brought this up, James. I don't cuss and I don't call anybody a drug addict. And I don't call anybody a drunk, and I don't call anybody that does, I mean, sinful things. I talk about it, but I don't I don't <laughs> judge them. It's, it's what I'm saying. If they want to do that, that's fine. I, I'm just the reporter and, you know, writing it down the way I see it. But never did I disrespect anybody because I don't believe in that. I, I really don't. Unless I'm on this show and I can call somebody just a no good son of a bitch. Oh, yeah. you know? and, but that's not really knocking them. That's just like, that's just a personality review, I guess. But, but uh, he made nothing on that. And I'm sure that, say, a T-shirt, if they sell a T-shirt and, you know, it costs seven or eight dollars to make a t-shirt. They sell it for 20. But the guy don't make that much money off the t-shirt. He makes a dollar and a half, probably. So, but anyway, that's just uh, that's the way they do it. Till, till finally the talent wised up to it and says, Well, hey, we can do this ourselves. And of course, promoters, they didn't like that. They didn't like guys going into the business for themselves. Unless it's the ones who didn't pay that well, and they said, "Well, this selling gimmicks would be a way to appease these guys, and they'll work for these crappy payoffs we give them if we let them sell the stuff." And so they learned. So everybody learned something about marketing and what people will take and what you what deals you can make with them. So that's just the the seedier side of the wrestling business. We, well, speaking of everybody wants something for nothing, but people who tuned into Storytime with Dutch Mantel last week had the opportunity to get something for almost nothing. They just had to know the answer to a question or, you know, Google it or try and find out. And 
we had a little quiz for him last week, Dutch. So we sure did. Do you want me to say because it was a very specific parameters we had to set here? Do you uh, do you want to recall what we asked last week? I think we we recalled, and we didn't come up with this till almost going on the on the on the air last week. Not on the air, but when we getting ready to record, and it was. Who was the only wrestler who won a match while he was dying, I think, right? Even more what specific. Was it? Even more specific, because we had to be more specific. Who was the only wrestler who died while um, catching the winning pinfall on an opponent? We had to be very specific with this. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, the wrestler who died while... Uh, so how this happened was the wrestler in question uh, did a standing splash or running splash onto his opponent and I figure he must have had a heart attack and just died instantly on top of his opponent while getting the winning pinfall and there was only one who qualified so uh, we got as you can imagine dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of emails in most people got it wrong which normally for you know something with the internet these days you sort of think well everyone's going to get it right most people got it wrong so we got uh, here's some of the wrong answers uh, Mizawa, who died after a back suplex. Moondog Spot, who you were present for. I Mike DiBiase, who died during a match. I mean, all of these died during a match. King Kong Kirk, who was an English uh, wrestler, but he was the one taking the pin. Pero Aguayo Jr. Plum Mariko, who was a lady wrestler from Japan. Eddie Baker. Uh, a couple of people said, and this was interesting, ancient Greek pancratist or wrestler at the time, uh, and this is a great name, Ah. Uh, Arhichion, or something like that. I'll probably butcher the thing. Two people wrote in and said that. A Greek guy who did indeed die while getting the win over an opponent. But the fact was that he didn't get a pinfall. The guy tapped. So, uh, But somehow he ended up either choking himself out or breaking his own neck in a submission move. Now, l- l- who would know that answer? More than one person knew that answer and sent it in. Really? I, d- I didn't know that. There we go. Um, a couple more. Uh, someone said Ted DiBiase Sr., who is still alive. Uh, Silver King Ray Gunkel, who you were also uh, uh, in the building for that night. Now, uh, one more wrong answer that a lot of people said was Gary Albright. He was sort of married into the Samoan family. He was big in Japan. He was big everywhere, but he was big in Japan. Now, Albright actually died after taking a cutter from a wrestler called Lucifer Grimm, of all names. And then after Albright was motionless after this cutter... Uh, his opponent actually dragged Albright onto himself and then essentially... The, pinned himself. Essentially pinned himself with the arms of Wait a, minute, a he, dead person. So Albright was going over. We figure so, yeah. But, but he was dead. Yes. <laughs> so he pulled him and laid down and put his arm over him. Yes. I think that would be a sure tip-off that something's up. <laughs> You'd say, wait a minute, did yeah, I just say see the you young pulling? bugs are killing the business? I tell you. <laughs> uh, hey, th- you can't. Uh, we'll get in this in a minute, but you cannot kill this business. It's impossible. We have tried, and others have tried for sixty or seventy years to kill it. Can't do it. It's the mm-hmm. business that won't die. Yeah, believe me. Uh, so, uh, as I say, the very specific thing that we said was the wrestler had to have died in the commission of executing the winning pinfall, whereas Gary Albright, for all intents and purposes for our competition, had died and then got the winning pinfall. Crazy. Okay, how many people actually got the question correct? Under 20. Uh, as, as I say, you know, the, the majority of people, the vast majority of people... How many... Didn't. How many... How many... Uh, submissions did you have? Probably a hundred or so. Really? Yeah, so we had quite a lot. So uh, I'm going to give a few names out. Paul Watson, Michael Moore, Barry Francis, Nick Wheeler, Pam, Derek J. Day, uh, Robert Young, Johnny Blackwell, James. Uh, Some of the people who got the right answer, but we are giving the prize to Jason from Attleborough. So Jason, send us your address. You are a winner. And I'll email this fella, or someone will email this fella and ask and get the address from this guy as well. Wait a second. Why did Jason get it and the other people who guessed it right didn't get it? Uh, right. So do you want to know the methodology? Was I wrote every correct name down, numbered them all, 
And then I said to my missus, give me a number between 1 and 20, let's say. And she picked a number, and the number corresponded to Jason from Attleborough. So that is how oh. we picked him. Attle, Attleboro, is, is that in the UK? No, it's A-T-T-L-E-B-O-R-O. -O. Where's that, Massachusetts? I don't know. Never heard of it. Really? Well, I think they have one in Massachusetts. In Massachusetts, there you go. So, uh, 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 right. So, uh, what has uh, Jason from Attleboro won? He has won an autographed copy of Tales from a Dirt Road, which is, I, I got to say, which is a good read. Now, a lot of people won't believe this, but I have forgotten what I wrote in here. So I go back every now and then. And I actually read, I read a uh, a chapter in here, and it's like I've read it for the first time. I guess some people call that <clears throat> stupidity, dementia, <laughs> but it is a very good read. He has won this and autographed, and I may even send him. No, I'm no, not going to send it. No, I'm not going <laughs> to send him this. But I'll probably send him a, a little bit of a WCW card, which I think 10 million were released. So I have a lot of them. But uh, this is for his time, and uh, I appreciate it. And his name is what? Jason. Uh, Jason. Yes. So Jason send us your full name. Yeah, so What's send his last us your name? Full, oh, he didn't say. Send us your full name, send us your address, and that book will get to you in four to six months, right? <laughs> you had to bring that up, didn't you? Yeah. Dark Side of the Ring was on, Terry Gordy. That's probably going to take mm -hmm. up the meat of uh, this podcast, I think, at the end. But we've got some news to run through as well. And it's one of those weeks where it's just been low news. I mean, this is the first time since probably early January where there really hasn't been much going on, quite frankly. So having said that, we're going to dedicate some of this podcast remaining time to Terry Gordy's Dark Side of the Ring, ask some questions related to that as well. But first off, we want to wish Psychosis probably best known in WCW, briefly in WWE as well. Uh, Cruiserweight and probably Rey Mysterio Jr.'s most famous opponent, especially in the early days as well. He broke his hip back in February. There is a GoFundMe to donate to his surgery. And, um, yeah, breaking a hip is obviously no fun, I'm sure. I mean, that's got to be just one of the most agonizing injuries and it's ever a, suffer. I've heard this about a hip, a break in the hip. It's a long time to heal. Yeah. And that's why most people, when they're older, if they break their hip, it's almost saying, well, you're not going to recover from this because they don't recover. You know, hips, I guess, you know, they're, they're bones. They get brittle the older you get. So a lot of people you hear that are up in their 70s and 80s, if they break the hip, it's almost like, well, this is your... This is your swan song. You're, you you won't recover from this, and a lot of people just never recover from it. And you know uh, they die, not from that, but because it their health gets bad, they can't move around, and you know it's it's usually a, a death sentence for them. Well, hopefully, you know, not for psychosis. I think he's probably in his late forties or something like that. I didn't check his age, but uh, I checked the GoFundMe. We'll put a link in this clip as well. I'm sure. And Chris Jericho, like pretty much always is the top uh, donor to uh, psychosis' uh, uh, recovery and surgery. What did he so donate? He pledged $3,500 of his own money. And do you know what? I, because of this, I, and I'm sure you'll agree with me, Jericho's got his detractors for a variety of different reasons. Or, you know, he's got the people who love him as well, of course. But nobody can ever take away from Jericho that he's incredibly generous with his money. And when there's yes, a wrestler in trouble or there's a funeral going on, he is the man hey. to step up. Hey, uh, Mr. Jericho, I'm having a little few problems now. Can you just PayPal me like three grand? That's okay. <laughs> no, you need to no, go No, but he me. is. But, but I, I appreciate uh, him doing that and helping out a, a fellow wrestler. And But I think he's donated more in, in some occasions. And for other reasons. So if, if somebody is like that and is generous with their money, uh, I think he needs to be 
needs to be applauded for that, saluted for that. So my congratulations go out to you, Chris. So, but I have heard, I, and I think I've even read sometimes uh, that he's donated upwards of 10,000. Mm-hmm. So I don't know what, what for, but I, I think that's a testament to, to, to his heart and to his open treatment uh, or people in need. So, so why was psychosis needing this money? For the hip, we were talking about it. Okay. Uh, you don't have insurance? I That's not. what people say. You don't have insurance? You don't have this? You don't have that? Over there they do. Over here, there's, no one's got insurance. Or no one needs insurance. In in the UK? Yeah, no one needs insurance. Just everyone's covered. Whether well, you pay taxes guess, or not. guess where you do need it? Yes, the United States. Absolutely. Okay, continue. I, I was just looking up at other. So, but they do have a GoFundMe for psychosis. If anybody wants to contribute, yeah, I'm just looking at who else. Uh, Jericho donated to Virgil. Um, his funeral costs. He donated to Ice Train recently, who passed away. He was another WCW wrestler. Um, he donated ten thousand dollars to Dama Hamlin's toy. Sorry, I'm just loading the thing. Uh, toy drive charity following athlete's hospitalization. He's donated, in total it seems, from, and this is back in 2020, he donated $52,800 in total. He donated $5,000 to, to Kamala's funeral. Um, he's been donating for years, and I think it's a really lovely thing that he does yes, that. Yes, it is. Uh, other people do as well. But see, that John doesn't... Moxley's very generous as well, but you know, doesn't publicize it. Yeah, but the the thing is, what are people going to bitch and moan about? Because they can't bitch and moan about that. They got to bitch and moan about something else. So um, that's not that's not good for the podcast business. That's not good for like the the Meltzer Observer business, you know, mm. because he's talking about good stuff, and that doesn't get you clicks. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to talk about more good stuff. I've got a list here. This is back from 2020. Donate for Kamala's funeral expenses, Balls Mahoney's funeral expenses, Tyler Breeze and Kevin Owens with the uh, uh, had a charity for Alberta forest fires, three thousand for Rico Constantino's medical bills, two and a half thousand for Rex King's funeral costs, twenty five hundred for Jerry Lynn for medical procedures. Uh, I'll just give some more names. A sick cat. You just gave five hundred dollars for a sick cat. Um, Smoky Mountain ringing out to Tommy Nose medal medical costs. He donates it. Um, who, this was Jericho? Yeah, these are all Jericho. Uh, superstar okay. Billy Graham, Brian Nobbs, uh, George Floyd uh, as legal and travel expenses, Shad Gaspard. Uh, yeah. So there mm-hmm. you go. I just thought it would be nice just to sort of like highlight what a cool guy Jericho is, quite frankly. Well, good for him. There we go. Uh, right, so we need to spend the rest of this uh, uh, podcast shitting on people now. But uh, before we do... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, that was funny. That was funny. <laughs> yeah. uh, very briefly, UFC Kung Lee lawsuit settled. So uh, I know you don't know too much about this, so just because it's huge news with would have been potential ramifications, and now it's been settled less so. Yeah, former MMA UFC fighter Kung Lee 10 years ago took out a lawsuit against uh, UFC, Dana White, etc., for underpaying the promotions and, you know, mo- monopolistic practices, essentially. Uh, TKO have settled for $335 million in the case. Now, the fact is, is that people thought if this went to trial and UFC lost, which they pretty much thought they were going to lose, that they would be spending in the region of $2 billion in losses and uh, you know, punitive damages or whatever Damn, else. That's, that's quite a lot of money, by the way. Yeah. Uh, so, with the $335 million after legal fees, that will be split between some 1,200 fighters... Uh, did in, they wait a minute? Did they contribute anything to Psychosis's fund? Well, they haven't got the money. Nothing. Yet. They haven't nothing. got the money yet. Oh, okay. Yeah, we just won it. Uh, uh, so, so you know, it'll take a while. But uh, yeah, so uh, on average, one hundred eighty-five thousand dollars per fighter. But you know, it'll depend on how many fights they had, where they were on the card, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And after the news, TKO uh, stock jumped eight dollars because. Wow. Everybody within TKO and their stockholders view this as a major victory for TKO 
because they thought they'd settle for a lot more. Mm-hmm. So they they lost a lot of money. Or they got to pay a lot of money. Yeah. But yet it's a win for them because they thought they was going to lose more. Yeah. Oh, that's one way to look at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To the cost okay. of doing business, as I say. Uh, we're, right, yes, we're, gonna to, we're gonna move on to something that I'm sure you got far more opinions of. You still watch SmackDown every week, don't you? Yes, that's part of my job description. Mm -hmm. I'm a smack if hey, I'm, I'm for my job description I put down SmackDown Watcher <laughs> every Friday night. So it used to be almost impossible to watch. Oh, a couple it was, of years ago, yeah. It was that bad. It was, it was boring as hell. And, but you know, this happened. This happened. This happened. And what made it jump is Vince leaving the show. I don't <clears throat> see. It's hard for me to believe that Vince McMahon, major owner of WWE. Yet at the same time, when creative would give him their ideas for SmackDown, he just he would just say, "Get rewrite the thing." I, I at four o'clock we used to do it on Tuesdays. We do uh, Raw on Monday, then we do SmackDown on Tuesday. I have heard him doing both shows at four o'clock. He say rewrite it. So now these these writers were having to rewrite everything. In a matter of two hours. And in the case of Raw, that's a three hour show. Mm. And just, just because he had he was having a bad day or he didn't like this or he didn't like that. So that's why you would see those writers sometimes they would be in a bad mood. Well, that was why. Because Vince had just cussed them all out <clears throat> in a group meeting. And told them they're stupid, and he wasn't a he wasn't beyond that. He'd call them stupid and ignorant, and he should fire every one of them. So, I mean, and that would tend to probably put you in a bad mood. It would probably tend to put you in a mood to where you didn't feel very creative. But, but it was hard to watch. But now, since they moved Vince, and now both shows have gotten better, a lot better. So if nothing else, that proves how much creative can do, even if before you, you would think they were horrible at their job. They're not horrible. It's the people. It was the guy in charge hearing the ideas that didn't like it. So, I mean, you got a thousand ideas. But just pick one you like and let's work on it. Mm. That's then, the way creative. And stick with it. That was the other thing, because you'd have one idea one week, and then Vince would go, well, no one will remember that, and then just move on to a completely different thing. And there was no... Oh, it's just terrible. But that's because he didn't remember it. Exactly. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. But it, so it, we're it, saying the same thing. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's, it's like one of those things where... I was actually looking up Paul Birchall, right? Because we were talking about him last week. He was the guy who did the pirate mm. character. Yeah. And against all odds, that character started doing well until Vince McMahon just decided, we're not doing that character anymore because I don't get it. And then someone said, have you never heard of Pirates of the Caribbean? And he went, nope. So they changed him. Into <laughs> it's one of those things where, like, if he hasn't heard of it, he assumes nothing has heard of it. Nobody yeah, well, has heard of anything. Well, that's the way it works. What are you eating? I'm not eating anything. Oh, I thought I'm doing a something. little desk cleaning, if oh, you don't mind. Okay. I thought, okay, no, cool. I thought they were like the M&M bag or something like that. I was going to question no, no. what you were eating. Right, so uh, with the last <clears> couple of months or last month or whatever, you've been watching SmackDown and you have been witnessing the return of the bad guy, Rock. Hollywood Rock has returned. and f We haven't really spoke about him. But there's a reason why I'm bringing him up, but just initially, how much of a breath of fresh air is the Rock returning? Or is he just so good he makes everyone else pale in comparison to him as far as charisma? No, he, <clears throat> what he's done... He's a one-man gang of bringing back the Attitude Era <laughs> is what he's done. Because he'll, he'll go out there and he would do uh, interviews like he was, it was 20 years ago. And he's kind of funny, and it is a breath of fresh air because The Rock, I mean, who doesn't like The Rock, even being a bad guy? And see, that's what makes a great heel. 
when you want to see what this heel is going to say and how he's going to roast his opponent and, or the guy he's with. And I mean, you're listening to him and you're waiting to, you're waiting to hear something smart ass out of his mouth. Uh, the rock is, is what you're looking for. But in doing so, and I think this is the point you're getting to, I think he crossed the uh, standards and practices he, line. He did exactly. In, in, in language. Mm. <clears throat> so what do you do? So apparently the problem is not only in promos, which are scripted, uh, you know, Rock didn't used to do the scripted ones now with Brian Gewertz coming in, then uh, he does very much scripted promos. So the point where they know where he's going to swear in the m- monologue and then they managed to bleep it out in the right places because it's live. But uh, apparently there's a memo sent out to WWE talent talking about the need to adhere to PG guidelines on television and also, most importantly, social media. But the problem is, is that Dwayne The Rock Johnson, who is on the TKO board of directors, clearly is above WWE directive and has posted numerous promos on Instagram, sworn a lot on Twitter, and uh, the aforementioned SmackDown stuff. So I, I think... Do you think, you know, one of these things where a report like this comes out and, and some internet news writer would say, oh, it's rubbing people the wrong way, or, you know, everyone's really upset with The Rock because he can get one rule for him, it's one rule for everybody else. You actually think people are upset about that, or is that just people joining the dots? Well, if you had one, that would be some people. And they may be a little. They may be complaining a little bit. Well, he can say what he wants to, but yet I can't. Well, that's his that's his deal. That was the Rock's deal 20 years ago. And I mean, if somebody came out now and tried to use that language and you've never heard that before, it well, it sounds strange. It really does. And let me this is word to the wise. They're making big money right now. And Things are up. Uh, I would kind of keep those comments directed to myself and don't air them out in the dressing room because everybody has ears and everybody has a mouth. And if that gets the rock, well, so-and-so was saying that you shouldn't do that. Oh, yeah. Well, that puts that person in a bad light. And Rock just might remember that the next time they're discussing this this guy's contribution to the show. So just keep it quiet. What's my old saying? Stay in your lane. Stay in your lane and you're going to rub nobody the wrong way. Don't run your mouth. I learned that within the first year or two in the business. Old Timer said, just, just don't tell everybody what you're thinking. Because, you know, it's going to go exactly from that guy directly back to the guy you're talking about. And before the night's over, the guy's in your face. So what do you mean by that? And it's a way to, it's not a very good politically, a p- political way of advancing your, your career. So I'd advise everybody in that WWE dressing room, eh, keep it, keep it to yourself and go on. Just make your money and go. You're not going to be there forever. WWE is a, a stopgap in most guys' career, even in wrestling, you know. But it is a great, great uh, place of employment. Say you wanted to apply for a job and you put down between 2020 and 2026, I work for the World Wrestling Entertainment, WWE. Well, that's the first thing they're going to see when they're reading that thing. Wait a minute, you work for you 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 work for the WWE? Yeah. What'd you do? Now the whole conversation now goes to WWE. Because mm-hmm. they want to know what'd you do and where'd you go and who'd you meet and this, that, and the other. Because it does make anybody who has worked for WWE stand out amongst the people applying for that job. I mean, it certainly makes makes you stand out more than the guy that worked down at some department store running a, ca- uh, cash, a cashier machine all day long. So it is almost a reference unto itself. And even if you put it down in small type, it's still there, and people want to talk about it. 
But anyway, I would say that if you don't like what uh, they put out, watch your language, just watch your language and don't worry about rocks. They'll, they'll handle that on their own. <clears throat> now, The Rock was quoted as saying on Instagram, I think just before. Did he say anything about me? He said, Dutch Mantel should really watch this really close. No, he didn't say that. Yeah, he, so, he needs to watch that mouth of his. <laughs> yeah, okay. Says, uh, networks and quote-unquote standards and practices have issues with my language, but I'd rather be real than not. I talk from the heart, shoot from the hip, and try to always have fun, enjoy the rock concert. Mm -hmm. Now, is uh, PG, because this was from Nick Khan, this this memo, or whoever it's from. You know, it's from up top, so I imagine it was a Nick Khan directed. PG's stupid, isn't it? For wrestling, for pro wrestling after 9 p.m. or 8 p.m. or whenever it's shown in the States. I mean, PG. Well, to it's, it's a, simulated to a violence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it is kind of stupid, but. but it's like you, but it's about, like you, you but can like uh, smash people over the head and threaten to break their ankles and stuff like that, but don't you, stay, don't you dare say the word bastard. Or, yeah, whoa, and, you're off this screen. Let me tell you. Don't don't say don't say damn. It's a prick. What was it? Oh, okay. Prick. Uh, the um. Uh, um uh, who's go on? Who's the guy's name? Who Brad said Maddox. Prick. Do you remember who said prick on TV without authorization? Of Vince McMahon fired him. Yeah, but that's when they were like heavy into that. Hmm. And it was on a dark match. Did you know that? It was a, yeah, that wasn't and even he on was, TV. It was like the the warm up match. Oh no! And they probably taped it for something. Maybe it's for some Angola channel or something out of the country. Angola today. Yes, but yeah. <clears throat> he said, "Some of you pricks." And he and he he was just talking to the crowd. I'm sure they didn't even tape this, which goes to show you that Vince was looking for a way just to get rid of the guy. So he, and Vince didn't even do Vince never does that. Vince told the guy, tell Maddox he's fired and not to come back. That's it. And the guy went and told him, he said, tell him to get his bag and get out of here and don't come back. Unbelievable. I, I, I interrupted you before when I said, uh, PG, PG presentation, but heavy violence or simulated violence mm. or some such. Why is there such a dichotomy? I, I don't understand it. Well, join the rest of us. We don't get it either. So, I don't know. I, I have no idea. <clears throat> it's for the kids, I guess. I don't know. Ah, oh, dear. Uh, one more brief thing to add. Cody Rhodes would cut a promo on Raw this past Monday where he also went beyond the usual accepted standards and practices when he asked if The Rock would have big Dwayne energy or little dick syndrome. And that got quite the reaction this Monday as well. well. Yeah. Well, you have to put it in writing. But they, but they didn't. Say but dick? <laughs> please, I don't, I don't know. But I did like the saying, and it got a hell of a pop, and it got a hell of a pop because the people aren't used to hearing that. And yeah, there's a there's a lot of kids out there, and that's not the worst thing they can say. But beating up. Hey, here's here's another thing that I, I won't do. it's pertinent, but it's not pertinent. You used to couldn't even touch a woman. A man could not even touch a woman. Now they're it, it goes in and out. Then you you see them slapping around and doing this and yeah, doing but, that. But and, men still can't hit women, but women can hit men now. It's uh, that's an odd. Hey, wait, one now. yeah, that's. Yeah, women, but I've never liked that anyway, to tell you the truth. I've never liked the women hitting the men either. One time that Lana, that, uh, what's her name? No, C.J. Perry. C.J. Perry. She slapped me one time on TV, and she says, well, how would I do it? I said, well, don't make it look fake, whatever you do. I said, the best way to do that is just to slap me. Have you seen this new thing they have on TV now? It's called, it's a slap contest. Oh, power slap. Yeah, it's power awful. slap. She hit me, but on my ear. My God, I swear to God, she damn near knocked me out. 
I said, now that would be a good thing to see on C uh, TV is Lana or uh, CJ Perry is slapping me and me just flopping down. Bam. I'm out. But I went back and I said, do I owe you money or what? She said, no, what? She said, was that a little hard? I said, a little hard. <laughs> why did you, why didn't you just take a baseball bat and hit me? I said, she really, she really jacked me, but Hey, I told her to, I'd rather her do that than it look, and it looked a little fakey. And, and she did what she was told. She slapped the hell out of me. So, and I, I had to feel, I had to get a little feeling for Rusev in, in my heart a little bit, because I know he's been probably on receiving in a few of those, <laughs> a few of those slaps, which goes back to what you're saying. Okay. For the woman to hit the man, not okay for the man to hit the woman, mm. which I still kind of, kind of believe in because the man is really so much stronger than a woman. And I hope I don't get any feedback off that, but we can talk about that too. Okay. So what were you talking about? Oh, I was just going to say CJ Perry's got a hell of a slap and fellas. She's single now. She does. So she she does. And she, she's free now. Oh yeah. yeah. So. What, couldn't you just said to her, just, just aim it towards the mustache. The mustache will absorb the slapping energy. And well, it wasn't this big then. It was just it was just hanging down just a little bit. Have you ever been uh, in a wrestling sense? Let's not yes. delve into the private life, uh, but have you ever been slapped by any other valets, lady, you know, lady valets, manager, uh, managers, and that kind of thing? Because oh, I, I have. Who's hit you? The nothing hardest? like she, nothing like no, her. <laughs> she was the hardest by a long shot. She slapped me like I owed her money, so. Or that I was her husband and she caught me cheating on her or something. But it's funny you say that because they're getting divorced and you say something about you cheating. With, uh, make, stop it. it! wasn't you. No, was it? no. I'm 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 way out of CJ Perry's league. I would not even look twice at her. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I I always liked her. She was a she was funny and she enjoyed my bullshit. So and working with her was. It was easy, really, till we got to. I, I kind of omitted any kind of a physical violence between us, especially when she was the originator of it. I said, I don't think we need that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one more thing that I want to bring up with The Rock. Now, LA Knight, when he came out with you know the new LA Knight persona, yeah, yep. and all that kind of thing. And the knock on him, I mean, there were a lot of people praising him, of course, like that, you know, he finally found his footing, charisma, and basically a lot of people were saying he was doing some sort of homage to somewhere between Steve Austin and The Rock. Yep. Now that The Rock is back, do you think that somehow indirectly affects LA Knight? I'm not saying that The Rock is, you know, going to do something to his career or anything like that, but now no, that I The Rock it, is doing I The think... Rock instead of LA Knight doing The Rock. Well, I think it helps him. Oh, do you? Oh, yeah, because I think Rock will look at him and say, hey, he's got a good mouth on him. Hell, let's have a battle. Except that The Rock has a writer. <laughs> <laughs> and I think uh, L.A. Knight would kind of be on his own. But I would like to hear them go at each other. And I think a lot of other people would, too. And I think they'd have a hell of a match. So, hey, I've known L.A. Knight. Uh, well, I had him in TNA when I was there. He could talk then, but everything else was so messed up then. You know, he's and he was still standing out because of his interviews. He was, but it just wasn't to be. And then he, then he finally got into the school in the performance center. Hell, he stayed there five years, didn't he? He was. <laughs> How long yeah. was he there? Where? Before performance before. center in Orlando, yes, I can find that out for you in a or NX, you give me uh, a, me NX. A, I'll pause, I'll pause and find out. Okay, right, I'm on his Wikipedia now. He was in uh NWA Championship Wrestling from Hollywood 2010 2013, WWE 2013 to 2014. He was in performance center for a he's probably only really there for a, for a year or so, and then but I thought he what was it where was he from? Where did he go to WWE? Where was he from right before this run in WWE? He was TNA Impact. He was there 2015 to 2019. 
Then he was in NWA for two years, 2019 to 21, and then he returned to WWE in 2021 in NXT, and then he goes back to the main roster in 2022. Mm-hmm. There you go, Ren. That's the, that's the whole story. Well, but that's the first time that I saw L.A. Knight kind of walk into the building or walk down. He was giving off those uh, Stone Cold vibes a little bit. Because he walks alone, and he was like a loner. Stone Cold was always a loner. And the way he talks, I think he has more Stone Cold than he does The Rock, but he's he's taken a little bit from both of them. And he can make it work. He hmm. really can. We are going to move on now. Matt Hardy. I was talking about Cody Rhodes at Raw. <clears throat> Someone to witness the little dick syndrome line from Cody live was <laughs> you love that yeah, I do like that. Uh, <laughs> so uh, because Raw was filmed not far from his home in Cameron, North Carolina, Matt Hardy and your favorite Revy Hardy were in yep. attendance for Monday's WWE Raw show, hanging out in a private suite. So Revy posted video of her and Matt at the show on TikTok as I smashed the microphone with my hand. So wait a minute, he had a private suite. Yeah, a, yeah, a box. Did he go down and mingle with the with the talent, with the boys, as we say? That I don't know. I th- maybe he was just a paying fan that day. I mean, he must have spoke to somebody, surely. But uh, he was filmed by various fan cameras filming Matt. He was, you know, there yelling and mugging and stuff like that. But also, Rebby Hardy took video of the whole trip and posted it on her TikTok as well. Now. It's not really a problem when wrestlers go to another wrestling event, you know, contracted wrestlers go to another company, that kind of thing, because recently mercedes Monet, uh, her AEW debut was witnessed by Naomi, Bailey, and Tamina Snooker. They you know that attendance. woman has, has never spoke to me? Which one? Mo- Monet. I'm not surprised. I mean, you always say she's not worth the money she's being paid. She never even said hello to me. That's just when I was in WWE with her. Okay. She never said, hi, Dutch, or hi, Zeb. She never said any of that to me. I don't know why. She just never spoke. Hmm. And if she didn't spoke, see, it's, it's actually protocol for the younger talent to say hello to the Established talent first. That's the slight protocol. But she never did. And what's your next question? You said, well, did you ever say hello to her? Ask me that question. Did you ever say hello to her? No, I didn't. Mm -hmm. She didn't speak. So that was telling me, well, don't speak to me. I'm royalty. And I said, okay. That's what I got in my head. Was anyone else like that? Did no one else say hello to you that you thought should have? In uh, during the Zeb Coulter run, uh, they a couple more too, but I can't remember who they are now. We'll throw them under the bus in a in a future episode then. Yeah, okay. Um, no, I so anyway, the point is, is that you know it's not a big problem for contracted employees to go to another company for whatever reason, you know, as long as they keep it low key. But Matt Hardy, who currently describes himself as quote still in the midst of negotiation with AEW, which I think reads that the someone doesn't want to re-sign somebody uh, were they were making they were making their appearance at raw as public as humanly possible now what way are you reading that as to why do you do, do they want the attention of wwe do they want to upset tony khan do they want to prod tony well, khan and to give him a better deal he's in the midst of negotiations with a aew yes yeah. that's who he's with now yep well, I think that I don't think he needs the money anyway. I think he was always good with his money. He saved quite a bit, made some investments, which is great for him. So he can go now now and play them against each other. I don't think WWE is wanting to play that much because I don't think Matt Hardy adds a lot to them, to tell you the truth. I, I don't. Uh, I don't think he adds that much to AEW or they'd be using him better. 
And it may be just that it's like me included. Time just goes by, and once it goes by, it's hard to reclaim. I don't know how they would use Hardy right now anyway. And I, it's the same as AEW. How are they going to use this guy to make him appear fresh, make him appear unique to even to the, to the younger wrestling fans that really don't know who he is? So I, I think if creative takes on a character like Matt Hardy, now they're saying, well, he was known for this and this and this. How many people will remember that? I think that really makes their brains go into overdrive. And I think <clears throat> for them, <clears throat> I think a lot of them would just, <clears throat> they don't know what to do with him. And I'm not saying that's a, a a lack of the the of creative. I mean, what would you do with him? So I mean, he's, uh, he's fifty. Does, he's injured a lot. He's had a lot of concussions. AEW haven't really done much with him in the three years he's he or four years he's been there. So I mean, mm -hmm. okay. So I mean, not to denigrate Matt, but I mean, is he worth at this stage your time and resources into rejuvenating him? Or do you just start with somebody 25 years younger who's cheaper, most likely, as well? Well, <clears throat> I would just bring it out what a creative is thinking. I don't think they know what to do with him. Now, Jeff is a different story because they know he's a daredevil. But he's over older than Matt, right? No, he's, the, no? he's, he's the younger one. But, I mean, he's probably more injured than Matt. Yeah, is. but he's... and. You cannot get 50 years old and go out there and be diving off stuff like uh, Darby Allen. Now he's hurt. We'll talk about him a little bit later. But right. you, you can't do that stuff. I mean, and let's face it, Jeff was always the core of the Hardy Boys. Always. He was he, – he just was. I mean – because Matt never did the moves he did. And now, Jeff, that's the way he got his notoriety is in doing these things. That's what he's known for. But the, there comes a time in your career, anybody, that when you hit that over 40 mark, you got to watch what moves you do because it could be your last move that you're ever going to make in a wrestling ring. So, but I, I don't know what he was sending the the message to him up there in the in the in the suite so i don't know now this once again brings up one other thing so kevin nash a few weeks ago I was telling you about this off air as well a few weeks ago just before sting's retirement <clears throat> he made a big old stink about saying he wanted to go but he couldn't be seen there because wwe what did he say, roughly? It was something like, well, WWE wouldn't have been happy and I've got a Legends deal with them and I'm an amb ambassador. And then, you know, that was basically proved wrong because Lex Luger was there and he's got basically the same deal. He's an ambassador. He's got a Legends deal with him. Lex Luger went there. The only difference was that Lex wasn't shown on screen. He was present for his friend, but he wasn't shown on screen and I'm sure that was prearranged. And as we said before... Naomi, Bailey, Tamina Snooker were all there for Mercedes Monet's debut. Not a problem. But Kevin Nash is basically... Do you think he's making up that it was a problem? Because he, he follows that up with, I, I still got to go and get in and out of the building. It's like, I don't want to go. Nash also added that nobody was <laughs> coming, him, coming to see him for Sting's retirement match. And then, quote, therefore, I don't need to be there. So that was a big change, wasn't it? Yeah, well... <clears throat> he probably didn't want to go, which he ended up saying. And he was probably using that as an excuse, which was actually a good one. But now, for people who are looking for holes in the story, like you, you said Luger was there, and he has the same thing. And they're, actually, they're both in the same boat. They're both retired. So... 
But I don't blame him for not wanting, wanting to go. But just say, don't, I, I don't want to go. It's thousands of miles away. and I've got to get a flight and stuff. What's wrong I'd with make, saying that? I'd make, I'd make Tony Khan pay for it. What, emotionally or? No, yeah, I'd say, hey, I got to fly first class and I'd throw a bunch of stuff onto it. It'd be, be like, like the, the bill would be so high, he'd even say, wow, I don't know if it's going to be worth this. So that's what I would have done. But yeah, he probably, he finally came in at the end. He just didn't want to go. You know, you can only go to so much uh, so many wrestling matches to finally, you just don't want to see the inside of an arena anymore. I mean, I'm, I'm almost, I'm at that point. I don't, I don't want to, if they'd invited me, would I have gone? Ask me, ask me. Oh, oh okay. If it is, if it's an event, say, in Tampa. no, you got to ask me, you say Dutch or, or Mr. Mantel's better. Yeah, ask me. The filthy one, dirty Dutch Mantel. Oh, you're talking to me? Oh, yeah. Wait a minute. Would you... you you're if, talking to me? If, you're talking to me? Well, there's nobody else there, so I must be talking okay. to you. Uh, yeah, so in all seriousness, if there was a WWE event in Tampa and they called you and said, would you like to turn up and say hello, just be in the back and say hello to people, would you actually go genuinely? Uh, well, no, but see, it's not Tampa because I'm already here. I know. I, I you, changed the you got to say, like, Dallas. Say Dallas. Okay. Uh, what was Attleboro, Massachusetts? <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> that, that, that's a good one. That's a good one. Would I go there? Oh, yeah. No, I don't want. I don't want to go. And I would say that I don't want to go. Mm. Or really, you got to be kind of politically correct in saying, you know, it's a long way, and I'm kind of hurt, and I've been warned against flying and all kind of stuff like that. So. Mm. But I wouldn't have gone, really. And I don't blame Kevin for not going. Do you think it's and Kevin if it had to get been himself for himself over? Do you think it's just Kevin Nash trying to get himself over and just attach himself to the Sting retirement thing and have his own story revolving around it? Or do you think that's just me overthinking no, that's, it? That's just you. No, Kevin just didn't want to go. He just, he's retired now and he's not used to going. So trips like that now wear your butt out. We used to do that every day, every day. So, well, speaking of trips, I'm going to be in Philadelphia in a few weeks. Who? Me. I'm going Philly in a few weeks. Right. You're going to WrestleMania? No, I didn't say that. I'm going to oh. WrestleCon, and then I'm doing some work at WrestleCon. Oh, you are? Yeah, I think so. So that'll be good. That'll be good. Oh, there's no direct flights from. Manchester. And everybody, no, everybody else will be saying, "Man, I love that show you and Dutch, love it." And so get you some pictures and get you, you know, put your arm around people. And John Terry, do you know what it is? I'm worried that like we've said something on the podcast or whatever, and someone's going to be like, "There he is, I finally got him," and then like yeah. grip me and then oh, say, they "Do could, you remember on no. episode 41 where you said so and so and so?" And I'm like, "No, I don't remember." Who are you? That kind of thing. Yeah, they they won't say nothing. <laughs> oh, then well, you, so. all you got to do though is say, "I'll make it up to you." Come on the show, and we'll make you look for like free. a million dollars. Yeah, come on the show for free. Oh yeah, come on the show for free. Of course, that's the, that's the standard fee. <laughs> free. <laughs> you know, if somebody says, "What's it going to cost?" and you say, "What money?" And then, you know, you give the deal like, well, hey, we'll watch for, uh, we have 115,000 subscribers, 115,000, everybody. Oh, yeah. 115. We're, we're, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're getting there. We're, 125 by June, I'd like to think. Really? I don't think we'll make 125 by June. We might. By the end of June. Really? Yeah, I'll okay. say that. I'll stick okay. my neck out there. Right, we're I'll stick your neck out there. Okay, we're, go ahead. Like that. So you're going to WrestleCon in May, April, April. Okay. All no, right. you're going. You're going Evansville in May. Yes. So that's going to be your first signing in two years. Probably. We'll give it a plug. Why not? May tenth, eleventh. Yeah. Evansville, May tenth, eleventh. 
at the National Guard Army is supposed to be in the building, but they're undergoing uh, renovations in the building. So they pushed us down to the National Guard Army, which is not that big, by the way, but it will be full. So you can get your tickets. Uh, if you just look it up, the it's actually Jerry Lawler is going to be there, me, Dundee, Handsome Jimmy, Austin Idol, a few more. But, and are they going to have a, somebody asked me, are they going to have some matches there too? I don't know. I have no idea. You versus again, Austin Idol. Uh, you take the pinfall once again. Oh, 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 yeah. And then, wait a minute. What if I took the pinfall and then died? Hey. hey then see? you could be the quiz question for the next yeah, week's podcast. I, see, I'm always thinking ahead. See what I mean? I'm always thinking ahead. And you said, yeah, he's not with us anymore. And he... He did this for the show. Thank you, Dutch. See, see how good I am. So everybody, yes, yeah, so on May 10th, 11th, Evansville, get involved with that as well. Right, we're going to move on. We've got a couple more bits of news. And then, for goodness sake, do you know how I always say, oh, I'm not sure we've got enough news to fill out two hours. I think we have now. So we're going to do our best to get to as much Terry Gordy as we can. But made-up AW contracts uh, from uh, for wrestlers going in recently. So... Recent numbers, some of them seem made up. One of them's definitely made up. Uh, the others see, we don't a, know. You said AWA. Did I? That's what I thought you said. Uh, AEW. Yeah, Vern Gagne's not paying as well as he used to. No, sure, sure, sure isn't. You're going to so, you're going to say naughty word there, and you censored yourself. No, I did. Wait a minute. I don't talk bad about people. That's you behind the scenes. See, folks, this is not James as I know him. I was, and he's usually cussing and raising hell and drinking and shooting up and there's all kind of stuff. Oh, well, you know, you've got to make it through the day, haven't you? You keep telling me how much you hate the backdrop of my office, by the way. You didn't say it this week, but the no, last I two didn't. weeks. No, I I was nice. But it does look a little better. You got some, you got a thing over there in the corner. Which one? The well, it's your cabinet, you know, right there. Yeah, right there. Yeah, I've sorted it out a little bit more. I've got three of the four YouTube awards up there and the fourth one I broke in transit so I'm trying to get a fourth one there's a gap okay. there which looks really stupid now but uh -huh. do you know what's really annoying it's like behind me it's like 13 foot wide and it looks about 2 feet wide but the one thing I was thinking of right earlier in the episode I was just looking at the TV and I was thinking we could get some advertising on that thing just to play in a loop behind me S sell some space oh and that's a discussion we need to have off air. Yeah. <clears throat> because I'll tell you where I, what the idea I have later. Okay. Oh, well, there you go. Right. We've got. You haven't even told me about this. Okay. Right. So we'll talk about that off air, but we're going to continue. So made up AEW wrestler contracts, and this is recent numbers that have been floating. Okay. You around. you say made up, which is a tip off word. To I don't believe it. Some one is definitely made up. One and one's probably right, and one is questionable. So I'm going to give them to you, and you tell me. <clears throat> Will Ospreay, uh, Kazuchika Okada, and Mercedes Monet's AW contracts, and specifically how much they are earning, have all been in the news recently. So Ospreay's contract is said to be in excess of seven figures, sort of like one million dollars per year plus around that uh, around that position. And for me, it sounds relatively realistic. Okada's contract is reported to be worth $13.5 million over three years, and that's $4.5 million a year. And this is by Tokyo Sports, and people since have said that's a worked number by Tokyo Sports to essentially give Okada like extra credence, extra superstar power, I guess, uh, for that reason. Mm -hmm. But uh, apparently Tony Khan has not paid Okada that much. But here's the interesting one. Mercedes Monet is said to be earning $10 million dollars over the course of her contract which is between three and five years with the option to extend if uh, one or both parties so wish i imagine tony Khan or both parties but according to the observer monet was after becky lynch level money from wwe before AEW came in with an even higher offer so 10 million dollars <coughs> i mean i guess it could be made up what it is becky be lynch making well we don't know that either a lot. She'll be making well over a million a year. She was. She was even on that. Yeah, game but that's player. not. That's not three million a year. No, that's not three. Three point three million a year. Well, how do they get ten million out of three years? 
three point three 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 recurring. <laughs> Gonna ask me to do the maths on it. No, I don't. I don't think they're they're making that much money. I really don't. Any of them? What about Osprey? One million a year. Oh, he might make that. I guess that's. But that's twenty thousand a week. You know what I mean? Unless and he does have billions. Let's say that. But that's a lot of money. And for them to go out there and you know play wrestler for a while and. Well, uh, let me ask you this then. Here you got that Darby Allen killing himself, literally killing himself, diving off ladders and doing this and landing on concrete. What's he making, you think? Mm. Well, we don't know if he's still on like a five-year... Maybe he was in a five-year deal and he's still on his original contract and they just took a punt on him. So he could be making nothing. He could be making mm -hmm. low six figures. We don't I, I, low six figures. It's still well paid, especially for the amount they work. But I mean, you're asking me to speculate. Yeah, but by well, pa well paid, so. what do you what? Where do you place that? If I said I mean, well that's paid what, in that's wrestling, what... I'd say two fifty is very very well paid in AEW for the amount of work that they do. I'd say that's very well paid. Mm -hmm. Well, it is. It really is. To get five thousand dollars a week, basically, to sometimes they don't even get used. And how many house show loops do they have? Very few, very few. So, and they usually use use those house show loops for TV. I mean, how do you mean? Well. If they're going to make a little loop, they might as well bring some cameras and make, as, it, make a TV out of it. As far as on televised I, events, they have very few. Uh huh. It's, it's, well, it's, so it's merely it's, it's merely all things. But uh, well, at two fifty, yeah, they are being being are well paid. But let's say when you talk, I don't think. Uh, What's that Monet's girl's first name? Mercedes. Mercedes. Ten million dollars a year. They ain't no way. How many times is she going to have live events other than a, a, a pay-per-view or a TV? And they can only be those once a week or maybe twice, maybe. But that's quite, and I don't think I don't even think she, think she even, to me, to me, I know zero about it. I don't think she reaches the $1 million level. Do you? As in being worth it or as in being, well, what she's actually it, being paid? Well, at least Flair brought some advertising with him. That's why he's getting paid. Now, if these people would have a, an advertiser that would willing to step up and just so you can run these ads on the show and we'll pay her or we'll, we'll, we'll pick up the talent fees. Yeah. That's, that's, that's worth it then. But $10 million a year. I don't believe that at all. And I don't believe Becky Lynch is making the money. They say she's making for Mercedes Monet to be talking a $10 million contract over a period of five years. That's still 2 million a year. I don't think she's worth it. I know she's not worth it, to tell you the truth. Right. We are going what do you, to... You want to, is she worth it to you? Oh, God, Lord, no. No, 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 no. She's if you had a billion dollars right now, and they're saying you can get Mercedes Monet for $2 million a year, what would you say? I'm saying not a chance. That's my catering bill. Well, what if she come year? in and just slap the shit out of you and you, while you're sitting there in that chair? Oh, three million then. I'll, I'll... <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, since you put it in that language, oh, yeah. <laughs> you're quite the negotiator, Dutch, let uh, me we tell got, you. We got, a, we got a deal. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, so what is, okay, what is Becky Lynch allegedly making? Absolutely no idea. If I was to guess, two million, two and a half, maybe. But at least she goes on a road and does all this other stuff. Oh, yeah. But guess what she's got on top of that? 
gimmicks. And they can send her, if she signs a contract like that, they can send her anywhere. They can send her to do all kind of press conferences or go do this and do that. And hey, well, she, AEW she, don't do any press. I'll tell you that for nothing. They don't seem to appear anywhere and promote anything pretty much for the most part. So, you know, Mercedes I, I saw Dustin. I saw Dustin Rhodes on a, a local TV. I mean, he was talking about something. Uh, they were coming there for something, I guess, to run a show, I guess. What else would they be going to a town for? But I saw him on like a, a local talk show, and they kept him out there for, for quite a while. They kept him out there for six, seven minutes. Hmm. So that's long for like a, a little local uh, talk show. to, and, and he did well. He did really, really good. We are going to move on to someone else from AEW now, and you alluded to it earlier. Darby Allen, broken foot, out of the Everest climb. So he was going to be climbing up Mount Everest. You know, the, you know the only reason he's doing that, right? Go on. Because I'm going to do it next year. And he's trying to beat me to it. The first yeah. wrestler up Everest. You've got like so a he, mountaineer's mustache. I, I could buy I that. do. I, I'm going to get me some, what do they call it, Sherpas? <laughs> what, I'm just get me ride some, on one of their backs? <laughs> I'm going to make them carry me up that mountain. <laughs> and, but the only way I'll go, I got to be equipped so I can get uh, uh SmackDown on Friday night because they won't let me off of that. I got to watch it. And it's the first time wrestling has ever been viewed from the top of Mount Everest. Well, uh, the first wrestler, I don't know if he was the first wrestler, but the, was going to be the first wrestler to make it up there has now managed to break his own foot in three separate places and he's had to postpone his trip until 2025. And Let me ask you this. What was he doing or what stunt was he doing when he broke his leg? Right. So you know what the coffin drop is, yeah? So it's sort of like oh, yeah, yeah, backwards yeah. and... He just like falls that. back, right? Exactly. He did that from Brother, the... Brother, you think I would... Uh, listen... I would never do that. I swear to God, I can I can envision this. I get up there, I close my eyes, and I cross my arms, and I start falling back. All those guys doing this, <laughs> just opening up, and I just take the big bump. And they look at me and say, just can't believe you trusted us. See? So what happened? How did he land on his foot? Seemed like it'd be his back or his head or something. Well, I'm hoping I'm not getting this wrong. I watched the match. I thought it was when he did the coffin drop. So he says, uh, okay, as the read it from Bleacher Report, a couple of minutes into the match after Allen executed a front flip off the top rope onto White, who was standing outside the ring. Allen landed a bit awkwardly as he made contact with White and he was clearly in pain after the move. I messed up. I thought it was the coffin drop. I thought he injured himself oh. on. But no. So essentially, but- a, a fairly, fairly rudimentary move for Darby Allen, who's you know, went through plate glass a couple of weeks ago. Mm-hmm. It is. But, to, okay, when people talk about they've taken the realism out of wrestling, listen, if you were fighting this guy and he gets up and he's going to dive off on you, if you were against him, wouldn't a natural move is just to let him go? Why catch him? Because all of a sudden you got these guys all huddling up, like, oh, I got it here. I got it here, brother. Oh, get don't worry here. And for him to fall backwards, you know, if I'm fighting him, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let him, I'm going to let that do the damage. Plus, you can get hurt yourself by trying to catch somebody. And I said, well, I've told guys that want to do big dives off the top rope onto the floor or dive over the over the ropes at me. I said, well, if you're expecting me to be there, believe me, I'm not, because I am not catching you. Why? I said, brother, I'm not doing it. I'm not going to give you a reason other than I'm chicken shit. I don't want to catch you, but... Right, we've got two more bits of news, and then we're going to move on to what time we have left. We're going to talk about Terry Gordy. So... CM Punk, Booker T, altercation, which is just the oddest story of the week that's come out. Yeah. So. He he needed clicks. Go ahead. Well, apparently so. Right. So 
Uh, I'm going to read uh, both paragraphs. Bear with me, everybody. Referencing an alleged altercation between himself and Punk, Booker T said the following. I did. I saw Punk. We'll talk about that off-air laughs. I almost had a little run-in with CM Punk. The internet might want to pick that up. Me and CM Punk almost got into it at NXT. We'll talk about it later. I don't want to put it out there because they're going to pick it up and run with it. I'll talk to you off-air, Booker T, to his co-host, I imagine. And then, <laughs> a week or two later, Booker T has now revealed the truth about his wild claim, stating on his podcast that he was trying to entertain his fans. Look, me and CM Punk, we won't be having a fight, okay? I want to let everyone know out there I have no ill will towards CM Punk. Contrary to popular belief, I consider CM Punk a friend, all right? So when I'm saying something about CM Punk, guys, do not take it literally. Do not take it serious. Don't jump into that mud. If you hear me say anything here on his podcast, this show, it's show-related. I'm trying to entertain my fans. I'm trying to entertain the fans that's watching this. Trying to give you guys a moment where you ain't got to think about that kind of stuff. You, you ain't got to think about that kind of stuff that he just said he did. I'm sort of a bit stuck on that quote. Yeah. So you don't got to think about what I just said. <laughs> yeah, that claim I just made. Well... I think the hottest thing on the internet is when two podcasters get into it <laughs> or a podcaster says something about a wrestler and a wrestler, he hears it because somebody, uh, somebody else uh, puts it up. Oh, Dutch Mantel or Booker T blast so-and-so. And so when you're going to read it, it's got to be a negative connotation for you to go read it. Or this is another one. Uh, Booker T shoots on CM Punk. Well, everybody's going to everybody's going to take that. You say, "What did he say about him? What did he say?" And he could have said anything. He could say, "Yeah, he he's had a great career and he's a great guy and he goes to church every Sunday and but it's that headline that grabs you and makes you click on it." So but he said that made it sound like they almost got into a a tussle. He was a, he works at NXT anyway, Booker T's announcer, right? He does, yes, with his uh, unique brand. And of, CM uh, Punk, country. they took him down there to, Glad I hand. guess. Just say hello, I think. Mostly well, I think he's, Michaels. he's in a teaching role right now. Guys I, can I, come I, I don't think Punk is. I think he's just making visits and anyone who wants to talk to him. Well, can. it's the same thing. Yeah. yeah, it's the same thing. Rather than formally do classes or anything, I mean. Well, if he's talking to somebody, oh, he can do, he can do a class. But I, I think he's just, there, like you said, he's just there to, to help these guys. And it may be even better that he's there to help you privately, individually. Which, you know, and I think would probably be a better use of punk anyway. But, but so Booker T lets on like him and punk almost got into it because, because how many times have we said that uh, punk raised hell when he got fired from AEW? And, and I've often said, I think he got fired on purpose. Mm -hmm. And, and who knows? It could be a work between him and Tony. Not to make Tony look bad. I don't think he could look much worse than that, though. But anyway, uh, so so he could leave. Anyway, but Booker T has now dropped, dropped the ball on his little tussle with CM Punk saying that it was, it didn't really happen. Mm. So I'm reading this. I'm saying, oh, boy, him and Punk almost got into it. Then I'm reading no, they didn't. I went, oh, God. It's like, it, there's no Santa. Really? It's not true. I fell for it. Oh, my God. So the next thing next thing Booker T says, you're not going to believe that. So may, it may be a way to get people not the book on your stuff when they can't <laughs> believe you anyway. We uh, This is going to be our final bit of news, and to be honest, I think it might be our most interesting as well. Ronda Rousey has released, uh, or is about to release, her second book, Our Fight. And she released, or publisher released, several ex excerpts uh, from it, and including some very harsh words directed against WWE. And then she also did an interview yesterday, as we record this as well. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Further blasting a couple of people with WWE. So bear with me, everybody. She blast me. Did you, did you ever, blast you, me? You, you never worked with her, did you? No. 
podcaster Dutch Mantel. <laughs> Challenges Ronda Rousey. Yeah. yeah. In naked mud wrestling. That's what the last video should be. I'll just title it completely <laughs> wrong, like totally oh, yeah. clickable, and then it's like, oh, well, you, you know, you clicked on it, you fell for it. Right, so here's some of the quotes, and I will be doing a bit of speaking. Do bear with me. It's hard sometimes to know where the evil, unethical slimeball character of Vince McMahon played out for the camera ends, and the actual questionably ethical, many times sued and multiple times accused of sexual misconduct Vince McMahon begins. That blurred line between character and reality is a recurring theme within the WWE universe. Another excerpt reads... Pay-per-views are held in major cities in New York, Los Angeles and Philadelphia, as well as now twice a year in Saudi Arabia, a nation that restricts the rights of women in a way that I'm certain Vince McMahon wishes he could. Elsewhere in the book, Rousey talks about how female talent in WWE has been treated in the company, and this is really the meat of it, I guess. So WWE loves to do well-produced video segments about the legacy of women within the organisation, but the truth is women have largely been footnotes. For the longest time, they were relegated to serving male characters in a valet role, an overly sexualized supporting character that takes cheap shots when the ref isn't looking. Over time, as the level of female talent grew in the society, as a whole started to shift, the organisation gradually expanded the role of female wrestlers. I'm not quite sure whether... I mean, she's sort of blaming society there rather than WWE, I guess. But anyway, WWE builds itself as a sports entertainment organization. And just like in the mainstream entertainment industry, there was, by all accounts, a casting couch culture where men backstage in powerful positions pressured female talent for sexual favors in return for airtime. There were so what? many public... I, would you believe? Would <sighs> you believe? Now, there were so many public accusations it. and scandals, it's hard to keep track, and more than that, I'm sure the WWE managed to sweep it under the rug. She continues to say the company only began giving female talent more airtime after they were basically armbarred into it. And it was only after WWE was basically armbarred into it, following a global social media backlash, after divas were given a total of 30 seconds less time than it takes most people to read this paragraph for a nationally televised tag match, four women were given less time to collectively wrestle than every single man on the roster got for his intro music alone. One more quote. Presented this information as a person outside of wrestling uh, world, you might draw the conclusion that there is a troubling foundational sexist patriarchal culture within WWE. You would be right. I have nothing but respect for the female wrestlers who paved the way for women wrestlers today, and nothing but disgust for the amount of sexist, degrading bullshit they were put through. Okay, we'll leave it there for now. Uh, I've got a couple more quotes, but I mean, Ronda's not wrong. I mean, women's wrestling has only been taken seriously in the last few years in this in the states, anyway. Other than me, yes, in you, TNA, yes, yes, you took it I, seriously. I, that's a very good uh, point. You, you were one of the first to actually say these no, girls can draw. I showed, I showed Vince, and I'm not saying it's because it's me, but I always thought that if you treated these the girls seriously as a serious, uh, a serious competition and an athletic competition, that yes, they could, they could. They could draw ratings and draw money. And I proved that with Gail Kim and Kong. And we did almost the highest rating up to that point in TNA ever. And I think the only other segment that beat it was when Hulk Hogan was there the first time. Mm -hmm. And we did almost a 3.5. That's pretty good. Great. And Gail Kim and Kong went out there and really – Really, as they say now, at a banger, they did. So, but uh, I don't know how to take Rhonda's quote. She was mad about some other things too when she said this, and I don't, I don't question or doubt what she said is is true. But you also can't doubt that what they paid her was a a pretty decent sum of money. Do you know what they suggested? I heard recently. I was th heard that Ronda made like a million plus, but I heard recently that Ronda, when she first came into WWE, was making either second or third biggest amount in WWE behind Brock Lesnar and maybe Roman Reigns. So we're well, talking around that. the eight million mark. Eh, I don't know about it there, but you know, people are going to believe what they're going to believe. I don't think 8 million, but I think she was paid better than most of those other girls combined mm -hmm. because of her, uh, MMA <coughs> background. And well, she was, a, but she's to the me, only pay-per-view draw. She was a proven pay-per-view draw in UFC, maybe third biggest of all time still. Maybe. 
And okay, so I'll tell you what kind of draw she is. I'm not an MMA fan, but she was beating the crap out of those other girls. She got my attention. So I'm using myself as a, uh, a, a barometer on what she can do. And when she knocked out those first two girls, I mean, first round, like two minutes in, she'd tap them out with that. She'd take them off their feet first, and she was very, very good at that. Where she wasn't good was throwing the hands. And that's what that Holly Holmes showed her. And she was rocking her, rocking her. And she she didn't get beat with on, on the mat. She got beat standing up and yeah. then got stretched out on the mat. She was knocked out. Yeah. High high yeah. kick to the head, it was. Oh, uh, whatever she knocked her out with. But and then from that then on out, you heard no more from Ronda Rousey. And I like the part that she rowdy Rhonda, she got that from uh from Rowdy Roddy Piper. She was a big fan of his. And she was a fan of wrestling to start off with. But when she got in and who, who's the guy that runs a MMA? What's it? Dana White. Yeah. When he saw her, he said, wow, we got something with her. And those two matches that she just totally dominated and beat those girls in the first round. Well, you know, he had dollar dollar marks going through his head. And then I forgot who they put her against, Holly Holm or somebody else. It was Holly Holm, and then um, I'll find out in a second. I've drawn a blank on Holly. The, Holly Holm was the last one, right? No, there was one more after that. Okay. Amanda Nunes. I didn't even, I just remembered it. She came and, back for a return with yeah. Amanda Nunes, and, but the fact is that she had a, a trainer who, for whatever reason, insisted that Ronda Rousey go toe to toe with Amanda Nunes. And it's like, Ronda can't box, not, not compared right. to Amanda. No. Or or Holly Holm, her strength was, ju was judo submissions well, ground game, all, and she left if, it. I mean, I, I can't even train a dog, so don't even ask me about how do you train an MMA fighter. But I'm saying, Rhonda, this is what I would have said. And I think most fans would have said her her strong point is on the mat. Take them off their feet so they can't knock you out with the punches. Hell, I saw that. But she tried to go toe to toe with him and got knocked out. So, but anyway, uh, <clears throat> I mean, just in whatever. UFC, it, just in UFC, she did get three, no uh, well, two knockouts and one TKO, and then she, uh, yeah, lost to KO and TKO to Amanda Nunes and Holly Holmes. Uh, before and, I forget, uh, and, and that push was over. Yeah, it was done. Well, they got one return match with Amanda Nunes, but then by that point, she was sort of exposed. I, I mean, it's like Conor McGregor, though. She was as big a star, as, nearly as big a star as Conor McGregor at the time. And uh -huh, she was. Conor keeps on losing, and yet he can... He's weirdly like Nate Diaz. Keeps on losing, but yet somehow people keep still buying the pay-per-views. Yeah, he's still a draw. Still a draw. Ronda, I think, could have been the same thing, at least for a couple more bouts. But uh, I want to get to something else that Ronda was saying in the quotes here. Or the excerpts, excuse me is that even when you were in the WWE in the mid-2010s, I gather that women wrestlers were basically told not to wrestle like the men. They were told to, you know, they were hampered to a point in their matches because they were told to essentially not do as many spots as the men and uh, they had to sort of like sneak stuff in and then gradually they'd be able to wrestle like the men like they wanted to. I don't know what they told them but they weren't booked on their ability to wrestle professionally. They were booked on their ability of how they looked. They were like strippers. They were like eyepieces. But because Vince didn't believe in it, he just didn't. Now, since the new regime is there, and since I had already proven in like 2008 when I had Kong and Gal Kim in TNA, they knew it could they they could draw. They just had to find they just had to find the formula. And they they found it, but they didn't want to use it. I guess. I don't know. Because I can hear Vince now tell them to stop that damn wrestling. 
you know, it's, believe me, I, I think Vince, unless he, if he was doing the booking by himself, WWE would have never reached the heights that it reached. Vince was good. Organization, uh, presentation. But as far as the in-ring work, no, we had to have actual wrestlers come in like Pat Patterson. I'd say that he had a, he understood the product, I think, more than anybody. Or even Road Dog. Road Dog understood it because if you ever see a Road Dog match, it's all, it's all gimmicked up and everything else. He's having a good time. And when a good heel knocks him down, starts beating the crap out of him, people want to see him get up. You know, he, he, I think Road Dog always connected with the fans and he was a good agent to tell these guys, don't do that there. Wait a minute. Let's bring it over here if we even keep it in. Uh, and that's another job that is not highly appreciated in WWE is the agents. That's why sometimes in AEW, you don't, you don't get the best match possible because I, I've heard, I'm not there, so I don't know. I hear they just overlook the agent. The agent is just the message boy coming, telling them who's going over and how long they got. But for actual, the construction of the match and putting it together, they don't even listen to him. But in WWE, they listen because they're told to listen. And how can you get a guy like, let's say, uh, Brock Lesnar had no, no pro wrestling experience. He had to learn all this stuff. And who was the other guy that had the long winning streak? What's his name? The tanker. No, Goldberg. No, Goldberg. Goldberg still can't wrestle. If you told him to go 10 minutes, you say, God, when's this going to be over? They conditioned fans to say, Hey, it's going to be a two minute deal. Both He's going to hit him. Goldberg. Massive. Yeah. If it goes that long and then it's over. That was his whole, that was his whole deal. But, uh, getting back to the girls, I don't think Vince wanted it because <laughs> I don't think he understood it. And he didn't think they would, uh, they would really draw money. Yeah. Vince, Vince McMahon's relationship with women is um, something we've often discussed on this podcast recently, but uh, we'll we'll leave that for there. Okay, you know how uh, Laurinaitis, how he found these girls, right? Yeah, just picked them out of a catalog, some of them, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, he'd call them up. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned John Laurinaitis. Right, so in a subsequent interview about... Uh, this uh, 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 promoting the book Rhonda said the following uh, and followed up with comments uh, pre, uh, with the book uh, describing WWE and how much of an absolute shit show it is at the WWE they can't hold, hold a sword over my head and hold me hostage with my own career I don't need anything from them and I don't intend on going back I can say everything I think and feel where everyone else that is held captive by their organisation cannot Rousey said she was held back on saying even more about her WWE experiences than she did in the book due to a contractual word count. She specifically took aim at John Laurinaitis and Bruce Pritchard, who she was going to talk so much shit about, saying in an earlier part of the interview that the two could go, and I'll leave it there, F themselves. The former WWE Raw and SmackDown Women's Champion also revealed that her career ended due to concussions that she first started suffering during her judo career. She said that she had to keep them a secret for years so she could continue to compete and perform, adding that WWE has a complicated history with their talents getting concussed, so she felt she couldn't talk about it. So, John Laurinaitis, Bruce Pritchard, doesn't like WWE, and then the complicated uh, uh, relationship and history with concussions, especially in the last few years. What's the question? Well, okay, let's go on Laura Nitus and Bruce Pritchard. Do you think I don't know what happened with <laughs> with with Ronda Rousey and those two? But I mean, John Laura Nitus well, is one of the most derided, were... certainly. Bruce Pritchard, some are, some aren't. Well, I don't think they tried anything with Ronda at all because she could have whipped both them at the same time, probably. 
Uh, and Rhonda now is she's mad at WWE, right? Yes, she's pissed at them. Very. That's why she'd come out with this book. And a lot of people will read it because she's negative about WWE. I get that. But yet at the same time, there is no, I don't guess, acknowledgement that WWE helped her through a rough time. Her UFC or MMA career was blown up. She couldn't get a match somewhere in Tupelo, Mississippi. Nobody would, they, they wanted to see her. But Vince did, or somebody did, and they gave her a job, a well-paying job, for her to not go out there and suffer any more concussions and be a name out there. And when they first signed her, I, was, I had my doubts. I said, I, I don't get it. And really, did she ever draw any big houses? She was a part of a card, yes or she, no? She. Uh, headlined, what was her biggest thing in What was her biggest thing in WWE? I think the biggest thing in WWE was she headlined the only women's card WWE have ever done on pay per view. Okay, and I think it did quite well. Okay. Oh, it would do good. I'm not saying it won't, but I'm saying her by herself. Ah, ah. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll give you something else. And with Ronda Rousey, her value, her greatest value to WWE was to Fox at the time. Because on the strength of uh, Ronda being hired and, and Fox wanted Ronda on SmackDown, mm -hmm. that's how WWE partially got such a great deal to move SmackDown to Fox in 2019 for, what was it, 2 billion or 2.1 billion or whatever it is over the course of five years. Little did Fox know that Ronda Rousey's one year contract was about to come up and then she'd leave. But weirdly, Ronda Rousey's greatest that, value yeah, to WWE that, was that. That may have been a huge sticking point in those negotiations, not knowing when Ronda's contract is going to be up. Okay, so her contract was up and then she left? Yeah, pretty much like, I don't know, like a, a couple of months afterwards or now, something? Okay, I'm, I'm just throwing this out there. Why wouldn't WWE try to keep her? She, she wanted kids. She wanted kids. So she uh, went to raise a family for a few years, and then came back for a year, and then the. And what was she making? What What was she making? You think? Five million plus a year, I think. See, I don't, I don't get that. Put yourself in the role of, of, of a female, which you do. I hear every weekend. I, I I'm sorry. I don't. No, no, I, I, I took it in on a Saturday and get people to call me Mildred. Yeah, of course I did. <laughs> but five million dollars. If I was a female and I wanted to have kids, well, that would just have to take a little bit of a back seat <laughs> for a couple of years. <clears throat> so I, I got the money to raise this child. Yeah, but if you got thirty million in the bank anyway, I think at that point you just don't care. She was, she was rich enough for MMA anyway. Uh, do you know what? Okay, like, I, I got that. Yeah. I think, uh, oh, very briefly, uh, the complicated history. I'm not even really sure we can sort of say the complicated history with um, concussions and not telling people in WWE because they take you off the road and stuff like that. And I know some wrestlers who have uh, tragically told the truth on their physicals before they went to WWE and then they wouldn't hire them to wrestle, that kind of thing. So I think it's almost second nature, even though. Concussion protocol is much improved and, you know, they're far more sympathetic to injuries. If you have the wrong type of injury, it could cost you your career before it even starts with them. So who can blame wrestlers and personnel like that from being secretive about their medical histories in that sense? I was always straight up. Truthful Dutch is what they call me. I've got hemorrhoids, I would tell the everybody. <laughs> I would tell the truth, even if it hurt me. I would just tell them the truth. So... You know, I even had to take a physical, a full physical for the Uncle Zebaka, or well, not Uncle Zebaka, for the uh, Zeb Coulter position. And that, listen, and they flew me to, I think, either Philadelphia or Pittsburgh. I don't remember which one. I got, I'm confused. But I had to uh, take a whole physical and do all the whole deal. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, I'm a manager. What are they what are they concerned about? But 
but I passed it, so I got a job. That's all I was worried about. <clears throat> right. In the remaining time we've got, we'll, we'll 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 do a little bit on this. Definitely, Dark Side of the Ring. I yep. actually watched the week before with Buff Bagwell, and mm-hmm. then yesterday or this morning, sorry, Terry Gordy was the subject of the episode, and it was pretty much like a straight biography of Terry. It wasn't like any one particular incident. I mean, there was a big incident in like '93 or something. But I'm going to ask you some questions derived from the show itself. And the main thing is that Terry Gordy was a wrestling prodigy and he got into the business aged 14. Is that the youngest as like a professional wrestler on TV, wrestling men? Uh, has, you know, it was very, I don't know if he was, uh, I don't know if he was the youngest, but he, he was probably, he'll be in the top two or three, I'm sure. When did you first meet Terry? Oh, I met him my I really don't know when I first met him. When did he get in the business? When when was he 14 oh, on Lord, TV? Oh, no, you're asking. Um, probably like 74 or 75, maybe. I didn't meet him that early. So but I had, heard ab- I had heard about him, you know, by the time I was hit the first, I went down into the Caribbean for a while and I come back. I was starting to hear his name then. So uh, I probably, first time I ever saw him, I guess, was was on the uh, the old NWA show out of Atlanta, out of Channel 17, TBS. I think I saw him on there first, but I kept hearing some some things about him. And then... When I first worked with him, I went to Florida, and then Michael Hayes came in, and we were the booker and the co-booker or whatever. And then, of course, Terry Terry came with Michael. And I think this was – when did the incident happen in Japan that he got – all messed up on uh, around ninety three, I think. I'll confirm later on down the script. But this was in the nineties that that happened. Okay. Well, when I first met him in the eighties, he was. They were just, you know. They were all drinkers. They were all hell raisers, but. But Michael was a, he was just, when you look at him, he weighs what, 280, 290? Michael and moved Terry. like, I mean, Terry, I mean, uh, 280, 290, and moved like he was 210. I mean, he could fly. So, so of course, to the Japanese, he was like, well, my God, because you didn't have Hanson over there flying around. You didn't, damn sure, didn't have Abdullah flying around or Brody or any of those guys, but here they got this big guy, 6'5", 280, 290, could fly around like a lightweight. And when it time come to open up, he could really open up. And the Japanese people, they base Japanese wrestling on believability. You know, most of the Japanese fans they were thinking that what they were seeing, especially in these later matches, was kind of was kind of real. So, and he made a big impact. So, they didn't want to use the free bird so much. And that's like in watching the thing that you sent me. It was Gordy's son. Mm-hmm. He was saying they weren't really interested in the free birds as a group, but they were interested in Michael as a single. Yeah, the uh, Japanese aren't as interested in flash and pomp and circumstance as much as they just want some and, as hard hitting realism as possible. Yeah, and Terry clicked all those he clicked all those boxes for him. Big, you know, and they don't even care how you talk, just acting. If you just see Abdullah never said nothing, but he, they just people looked at him and thought he had to be wild. And Brody, whatever he said, it's not what they said, it's what they did in the ring. So and that was their contribution to Japanese wrestling. So now I met him in, in Florida, and then I met him later 
we worked some, I worked some independent show and I had heard, I didn't know the exact details of it, but he almost died in Japan, had to go in the hospital. Mm -hmm. But your version that you sent me said he did it on a plane. Yes. See, I, I heard that he had, they had found him in the room, but it, it doesn't matter where they, where they found him still hit, did a number on him and he was never the same. He was kind of all, it, it looked like a spirit had come down and not look like it seemed like, and just took all the life out of him. Cause he was laid back and he'd sit there and he wasn't the rambunctious Terry that I knew before. And he, and even his ring work didn't have the same viciousness to it. He was just, it's like almost in some cases he wasn't there when he was there, but his, his, his whole personality <laughs> had gone where it went. Nobody knew. But whatever he had used that night, or he, he took, it, it took that with it. So, and he was just, he was a shell, and you've heard this before. He was a shell of what he was. Did and you, it's, it, it's a sad commentary that it happened to him, but he had led a wild life up to then, and it, it caught up to him. We'll get to the pill culture in uh, a little bit to clarify. Yes, so Terry Gordy overdosed on a flight, essentially, and Dr. Mm -hmm. Dad Steve Williams giving him CPR. I mean, he'd overdosed before. So that's uh, where he time. tried to give him CPR? Yeah. Actually, on the plane. Tr tried slapping to keep him alive. Him. Yeah, he was slapping, slapping him, him and yeah. waking him up. Yeah. And uh, I, I know you were with Terry briefly in a crossover with the WWF when he was the execution. We'll talk about the execution in, in a minute as well. But um, did you ever wrestle on any independence with Terry Gordy on the card post-coma? Yeah. I wrestled him. Oh, you actually wrestled him post-coma? Post, yeah. uh, so It was uh, him so what... and who was the other guy that was big in UFC or MMA? In MMA? Big guy. Well, he was a shoot fighter. What was he? What was his name? Describe him. He had a, a mustache, a little bit, and dark hair. Oh, Dan hair. Seven. Dan Severn. In a te Terry Gordy and Dan Seven as a tag team. Yeah, well, and I, I wrestled him. And you know, when you're thinking, you you come from a world of worked, a work performance, and you go into the ring against two guys, or one guy anyway, a Dan. And you're wondering how how will he be? But actually, the, the those guys were they were more particular in not hurting you than the other guys were. Because and Dan and and I, I put Dan and Terry together. You know, Terry used to be the romping, stomping remake of Bruiser Brody. But now he's kind of laid back. And Dan, I've seen some of the things he's done in the MMA ring. So I went into this match. I, I, I'm thinking, what the hell is going to happen here? I was the mark. <laughs> I should have bought a ticket to see myself. <laughs> <laughs> because I didn't know how this was going to end up. And Terry was very easy and very laid back. And I'm thinking, wow. And, but I'd heard that about him. And even in the dressing room, you know, we were trying to go over the match and he's just looking at me. And I had heard all these things like he's not there. So he's not, he's not very physical. So you, you got to help him. And I've heard about Severn. I've seen some of the stuff he's done. So I, it was a, it was an okay match. I mean, we didn't have them rushing the ring and rioting, but we had a match passable and I, I'm glad for that. But, uh, Terry was definitely changed. Definitely. Did he, I, I mean, I know this isn't the era where you go over all the spots and half the match in the back kind of thing, but it was a kind of thing where 
would he read if you told him to do something would he register it would you have to tell him 10 times so he got it or was he just sort of moving in slow motion as far as as, as well, getting through a match in that sense basically he was slowed down a speed anyway <laughs> And you couldn't give him anything complicated like uh, hit me with two tackles, drop down, leapfrog, hip toss, I'll reverse it, come into the arm drag, slam, slam, drop kick, boom. He wouldn't get that. Well, hell, I wouldn't get it now anyway, so no, don't even try to call nothing like that with me. But, no, it was very simple. Headlock, take over, let's do this, get up slowly. And you talk him through it. No, and he could do the stuff, but if you gave him a list of things to do, he'd never remember it. Mm. I mean, he'd have it. He could probably go to about three, and that's and and as far as him as making up stuff to do, if, if something was off, and you stop and pause, like all oh, this off, everybody sees that. But I don't think he would be like one of the first to try to correct it. If people did catch that, he would just stand there and he'd be amazed like the people would. And putting him in here with Severn, Severn was, wasn't noted for that either. So it wasn't the easiest match I've ever been in. But I'm glad I got out without getting hurt. So uh, I'm going to ask you a couple of things about Terry. I'll ask you a couple of things about the people surrounding him. Did you do you remember the executioner? You were with the WWF at the time, but this was the time when you weren't really on the road very much, and you were basically on the uh -huh. way out. You, uh, I think, you were on the same card at Survivor Series '96 in Madison Square Garden, and they got Terry to where I mean, for old WCW fans, it looked like the old Black Blood, which is the Billy Jack Haynes when they made him an executioner, mm -hmm. and you know we're talking executioners in the '90s here, which is. Um, do I remember about, Terry then? About 300 years past, a gimmick past its prime. But yeah, as the executioner, as the, as the this was a relax. With his thumb up. He put his thumb up threateningly because he was going to... How do you do that? He was going to... He was going to... Yeah, I think he was going to hail a cab or he was going to do the, you know, the spike. Yeah. Do I remember him? I remember that night and I do remember him slightly, but we got to... You got to re remember that Terry, he wasn't the, he wasn't the same guy. Probably what I remember about Terry that night is him just sitting in a room getting ready. He didn't get out and mingle with the guys or anything. He didn't cause any problems. I think this was a uh, Michael Hayes project, I think. And Michael was trying. Michael was kind of his is gatekeeper kind of he was trying to give uh trying to give him some work get him some money because i don't think he was getting booked a lot and vince had heard about him but what he saw was a really broken down version of terry gordy in his prime and like i said there was nothing there all his charisma his personality, his aggressiveness, it was all gone due to the overdose incident. With Terry, when people talk about big men, you know, the best big men in the business, I think Terry qualifies as that, you know, 300 pounds plus. I mean, he did slim mm -hmm. down when he was in Japan, you know, in the early 90s, but mm -hmm. 300 pounds plus got the business pretty much straight away or, you know, well, you know, well into his teens. Where does he rank as far as the best of the big men that you've worked with? Uh, seen in general. Well, that's according to what you're looking looking for in a in a in a big man. He was more uh, agile than Stan Hansen, and if his aggressiveness had stayed the same, he was probably as aggressive as Stan because that's Stan's biggest point. He is aggressive. He will come after you. He will take you out in the crowd. He will beat the living crap out of you. He won't give you time to breathe. You know, all the people seeing is, you know, this one guy beating the crap out of the other guy. Well, human nature tells you you're going to pull for the guy who's getting the crap beat out of him. So come on back. And he's probably smaller and all. And especially in, J in Japan, he's beating up a, a Japanese guy and you're you're pulling for him. But 
I think he could he could have been the same as uh, a Stan Hansen. Brody, different style, very, very aggressive. Abdullah the same way. But he had he had he could fly. See, when the baby faces would make a comeback on Terry, he'd leave his feet. You didn't see Brody and Stan overselling for any of their opponents. And you no, know, they'd sell for Baba and they'd sell for Enoki and all the big guys. But underneath that top circle, maybe about two or three guys, yeah, they wouldn't even leave their feet. They'd beat the living crap out of them. And then they would save. And this is a good business uh, uh, dealings here. They would go off their feet for, for those guys, for Baba, for Enoki. They go off the feet for their top guys, which told all the fans out there, oh, well, these other guys, these under, uh, the guys that's semifinal and down, they don't have a chance against Brody and those guys that are Hanson. But Enoki does. Baba does. So, and that's uh, one way they kept the real realization or the realism in Japanese wrestling because uh, they had a, a, a pecking order <laughs> and the people, they weren't blind. They could see what the pecking order was. So, it, so it made, it had a semblance of sense to it. So that's all they were asking for. <laughs> and if uh, th we'll go back to Terry, if Terry had, maintain the same status quo he had before he got on the on the on the drugs i think he'd uh, he'd hit the same level mm -hmm. i think he wasn't over there long enough uh, and demonstrated that style long enough for them to uh for him to really reach the high echelons you like that word echelons the hierarchy of the business in japan it's funny, you know, he, he actually started in Japan very early and he was part of the most famous of Terry Funk's retirement matches with uh, teaming with Stan Hansen, I think, against Tori, uh, uh, Tori, uh, Dory and Terry. And he was, you know, it was a big deal in Japan for a while, a tag team guy. He did win the IWGP title at one point, I think. But as you say, you know, he was 30, he was in his early 30s when the coma when he got struck down with the coma, he did the overdose. See, that's and he the had prime. so many years left. That's the prime. Exactly. He had just learned by 30. He was still learning this business. You can say you know it, but hell, I don't even know the whole business yet. There's still things I can learn. I mean, very few, of course, but but he was he was still learning from those guys. And him by him being around the Fox and him being around Hanson and, and and Brody and Abdullah. See, they look at him and they want to help him, and they don't want to help him because they like him so much. They know they're going to do business with him later, and they want to be friends with him. They want to help him. They want to get his trust. Uh, they want to get his friendship. So when it comes time for them to draw money they go in there and they say well this is what we're going to do and now that he realizes they're not here to take his glory away but to add to it now he's more uh energetic to help and to do anything those guys want it's the old saying you scratch my back i'll scratch yours and uh we didn't get we didn't get a, f a fifth of what Gordy was capable of producing before he was out of the he was he was out of the limelight. Now uh, we're going to end it on this. There are so many more questions we can save for other episodes. Uh, you uh, you and I were talking a couple of days ago via messaging, and I said we should watch the Terry Gordy thing because there's not that much news, and you know I always say that, and then there's always enough news to get us through two hour podcast, but. One thing that you said to me that I wanted to bring up was, uh, and you actually said this actually to me, was that Michael Hayes was actually a positive influence outside the ring to Terry. Now, in my mind as a fan, you hear all these stories where, you know, they're out partying, drinking Jack Daniels, fighting, smashing up arcade machines or whatever it may be. But what, what ultimately was Michael Hayes' influence on Terry Gordy outside of the ring? Was he a big brother to him or did he keep him out of trouble more than he got him in? 
I probably, he, he looked after him. Terry's going to be Terry. Buddy, Buddy Roberts, he was probably the most negative influence anybody can have. He's a hell of a guy, but he was, he's, he's nuts. So you put all three of those guys together, and Michael's a hell of a drinker too. So I'm not saying all of the time that Michael spent with Terry was in a mentor mode <laughs> because they would go to these bars and they'd slam it down. And, you know, Michael could do that because he had Terry backing him up. So if he pissed somebody off, well, if you pissed uh, Michael off, then you piss uh, Terry off. And when, when Terry would come up behind Michael, you got a problem here. He reminded me a lot of, <laughs> of Tommy Rich, the way he talks. <laughs> but he he was like a, a three, four inches taller and probably outweighed him by 60 pounds. But anyway, Terry, just the, the, the look at him, because he was he was a big, big guy and could move. So, But I think when it came to wrestling, I think Terry, uh, I mean, uh, you know, I think Michael was a mentor and, but it's hard to mentor somebody when you're still on the damn, you still have a hangover from the night before. It's according to what he's can, he can remember, but, but I saw him in some of his matches in Texas against the Von Ericks. I mean, Terry was the, Michael was the brains behind the Freebirds. Uh, Gordy was the brawn, the muscle, and Buddy Roberts was the flyer. So when they put that together, and whose idea was it to put it together? Was that Michael? That's a good question. I don't know. Did someone put Buddy with them? Maybe it was like Michael and Terry, and then someone put Buddy with them. I don't know if it was Bill Watts or someone sort of inserted Buddy into the mix. A good well, question. they were all like everything. I, I think Michael says this. Everybody down south, especially in that period, if Leonard Skinner would on, wasn't on your preferred playlist or listen to them, I mean, you just wasn't Southern because they loved Leonard Skinner. And when they went out there to the to the music, uh, what was that song they played? Freebird. Freebird. I don't know how I forget that, <laughs> but but you could be in arenas with them and they'd hit that free bird free bird music it was like the forerunner of the glass breaking for for steve austin and when they and then everybody on their feet they were almost rock stars in a wrestling ring they had and i don't know if they were the absolute first ones to play the music it was either them or it was or it was lawler in Memphis. But then it became it became the thing. See, this is one thing that Vince didn't invent is the music, the entrance music for wrestlers. Well, of course, did, George was doing it in the 40s. He was doing it then. No. He, he may have done it in some places. I was going to say, he, he had pomp and circumstance, uh, Edward Elgar. You know, the same, well, yeah, the that, same they can, Savage. But I'm saying as a as a regular entrance theme. And then it went away. So with Gorgeous George, if he did have it, I I, I don't I don't I, I can't say yes or no because I don't know. But I think hang a minute. Oh my pausing. That's Vince. Huh. Vince, hang on, I'll call you right back. Okay, see you, man. See, well, hang on. What's what, what something you said deposition? about it? Something, yeah, <laughs> something you said on the show about him. But then he, I, I think if 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 he did use the music, yeah, they could have used the music, but as a regular theme, I think is of course the free birds heard it somewhere, somewhere. I mean. And Lawler heard it somewhere. It didn't invent it. I think the but, story is is that Lawler stole it from the Freebirds because I think the Freebirds turned up once, used it, and then Lawler was like, I should have theme music. And then got it from them, hey, supposedly. There's more, they, there's more truth into that than what you, that, what you would imagine. Oh, really? 
When did they first show up in Memphis? I can find out for you in the next minute or so if you you carry on. Oh, hang on. Oh, hang on. Okay. okay. I'll, I'll, go ahead and look when they first appeared, and I'll, I'll tell you. But I think he was using music back in the early 70s. Hmm. I think before the Freebirds got even put together. I think. Hmm. I'm not sure of that. But when he be when he became the king, then they, he got to wearing the crowns, and he got to wearing the robes, and then they play the the king music for him, and down the aisle he'd go. And I don't know if he was the first one to use music, but as a regular theme entrance, a ring entrance, they all use it now. Everybody. Seventy nine. So, Seventy nine, Michael Hayes. I think it was. Oh well, he had debut. Lawler had it. Lawler had it before them. Well, I think they had to get it from him because they were such Leonard Skinner fans. I can call Michael up and ask him. Oh, do it. What now? Okay. Hey, Mike. See, I don't even got a dial. He knew I was talking. <laughs> about. Hey, Mike. When did you guys start using that uh, Leonard Thinner, Leonard Skinner stuff? Okay. Wow. Really? That early? They said 71. Mm. How old were you? <laughs> you were 15. <laughs> no, but that, that is, that is a good question. Which is our question for the week? Okay. But we don't know the answer to this one though. So we might, this can be question for the week, but there is no I'm not prize. giving a, I'm not giving a book. You're breaking me. He's breaking me, ladies and gentlemen. No, we'll, uh, we'll, this is a prizeless entry. But if you do know, put it in the comments or email at questionsfordutch at gmail.com and we'll have a look through and see well, who came up with the... Um, right, because that they say rock and roll music first, entrance music, which probably is the Freebirds. But as I say, Gorgeous George. Someone had it before Gorgeous George as well, and I can't remember the guy's name. I don't know if it was in the 40s or, or even before TV. That happened, uh, but I'd be interested to know the name of the person who first went to the ring with entrance music. The first one, and when Jerry Lawler started it, and we'll figure all that out. So, any historians out there, let us know. But for now, we're going to shut down the podcast. I think so. Tuesday, as every Tuesday is asked so, for anything. Wait, yes. Let me ask you: What's the question now? Who used it as a regular entrance? Okay. Yeah. Who, who had, used it who, first? Who had the first regular entrance music? That'll be the question, but there is no prize, and we don't know the answer. So, well, there'll be a prize. We'll announce them on the show, and they'll become they'll become like brain of the day. How's okay. that? Okay, you are U University of Dutch's brain of the day will be your title. You can go around all for twenty four <laughs> hours telling people that you are that bestowed upon you by the dirty Dutchman himself. But for now, we're going to say goodbye. Questions for Dutch at Gmail dot com for Ask Dutch Anything. That is the episode every Tuesday where we take your poses and put them to the Dirty Dutchman himself, the crafty veteran. We've got all the T-shirts and plugs and books and everything like that we said at the beginning. So for now, thank you very much for watching. And Dutch, we will catch you again on Tuesday. We the people. We the people. See you then.